So welcome everybody, you made it. This is the last full session of Drupal Camp Asheville 2024. Um, I know your brains are full and you're probably tired, so I will do my best to be engaging and exciting and keep you entertained. Um, my name is Paul, I am with platform.sh. If you've not heard of us before, we are a platform, our secure enterprise grade platform as a service provider. We remove the complexities of cloud infrastructure management so your development teams can spend less time uh, probably fighting cloud infrastructure and focus more on doing what they do best and that's building out those next great uh, uh, digital experiences and websites. So whether it's one site or a thousand, whether it's Drupal or WordPress or Django or Laravel or whatever, uh, we can help you manage those standards, uh, compliance and security across all of those. But that's not why you're here. You're here to learn about GitHub Actions. Um, I will let you know that during my presentations I like to give a series of warnings. And I usually denote that by a flashing red light. So if you're listening in, I've got an animation right now of a flashing red light. Uh, I will let you know that I am in no way a GitHub Actions expert. I do have a couple of years of building out GitLab pipelines. Uh, but when I moved over to Platform, I was given the responsibility to manage and build out custom actions in GitHub in order to automate a lot of our, my team's responsibilities. And it was during that time that I came across a lot of frustration and confusion in that system. And that's what prompted me to build this presentation. What I hope to do is kind of help you navigate around those more confusing areas and really jumpstart you on your way into building out your custom automations. So my goals today are when you leave that you understand what GitHub Actions are, you understand the pieces and parts that make up GitHub Actions, those things that you're gonna have to use. One of those is the workflow, so I wanna make sure you understand what the workflow is and the pieces and parts that are required for you to build a workflow. In fact, we are going, you, I shouldn't even say we, you are going to build a workflow today, so you're gonna tell me what to add in. Uh, from there, we'll talk about the different types of custom actions that you can build. And then we'll begin to talk about the different pieces and parts that make up custom actions. Well then, along the way, excuse me, well, along the way I'll give you those warnings, those caveats and gotchas, those things you need to be looking for. And then if we have enough time, at the end, I'm gonna show you an in, a real world, in life example of a GitHub action in use, using everything that we've covered. Not using anything special, but just using everything that we covered so you can see how you can take that basic information I provided and actually go out and use that. So has anybody here used GitHub actions already? Couple, one, one of you? Okay. So for everybody else, if you're brand new to this, GitHub Actions is a service provided by GitHub. It is a continuous integration, continuous delivery system or platform for you to automate all the things surrounding your code base, whether that's building out environments or deployments or testing, anything that you can think of that touches your code base, we can most likely automate with this service. Now, there are a lot of pieces and parts that make up the GitHub Actions platform that you'll be utilizing, including things like workflows, events, runners, jobs, steps, and GitHub Actions with a little a. Not GitHub Actions with a big a, with a little a. So if you're listening, I'll get an animation of Jim Halpert from the office saying, wait, what? Yeah, so GitHub Actions, if you see it with a capital A, that refers to the service, the actual platform. If you see GitHub Actions with a lowercase a, that refers to a self-contained piece of automate, shareable piece of automation that you can utilize like Lego blocks. You might see them referred to as custom actions or just actions. Now that get, brings me to my next warning and that is that with the way, I mean, it was before Microsoft took them over, but the way they decided to name things inside the actions platform can be confusing like the capital A versus the lowercase a. But even something like the word status versus the word checks versus the phrase status checks are three different things. So if you find yourself in the docs and you read the docs and then you're looking at something in action and those things don't match up, you may have come across one of these scenarios. So we got workflows, events, runners, jobs, steps, and actions. How do these pieces all work together? Well, we configure our automation in a workflow. That workflow then is triggered by one or more events that then kicks off a one or more jobs. Those jobs run on a runner, and then each of those jobs on that runner are going to run one or more steps that will either run a shell command or a shell script or utilize one of those custom actions. So let's dig a little bit deeper in some of these components. So a workflow is again a file. It's where we're gonna configure all of our automation. 
Uh, the name of the file doesn't matter, but it does have to be a YAML file, and it does have to live inside the .github slash workflows directories that's sitting at the root of your repository. Now, you could have as many different workflows as you want, each of them triggered by the same event or different events. It doesn't matter as many as you need, and again, the names don't matter. An event, then, is some activity that occurs to or on or around your code base that we can use to tell the GitHub Actions platform, hey, I want to now begin these jobs. They are sometimes referred to as workflow triggers, but you do have a lot of them. So I'm going to zoom in here just a little bit so you can see, whoa, that was a little much, but that's all right. You've got a whole bunch of different events that you can utilize to give you fine grain control over exactly when you want a workflow to fire. A runner then is a virtual server instance where those jobs are going to run. Now GitHub does provide a collection of public runners. Uh, if you utilize those public runners, you can choose from Ubuntu, from Windows, and Mac OS in various versions. Um, if you discover that they don't offer what you need in one of those public runners, you can do a self-hosted runner. One thing to remember though is that because they are public runners, uh, when your event or when your workflow is triggered and kicks off, it might not start running right away. It might be sitting and waiting for a few moments to wait for one of those public runners to become available. Again, if you're, if you're seeing that you're having to wait too long, again, that might be a situation where you need to switch to a self-hosted runner. A job then is simply a collection of steps. It's a series of steps that we want to have run. Now each of those runners, or excuse me, each of those jobs are going to run on a specific runner. And we tell the actions platform which kind of runner we want to run on by using something called a runs on property. It's also important to note that no matter how many jobs you have in there, they're all going to, by default, run at the exact same time. They're going to run in parallel. Now we can alter the behavior. We can build dependencies by in between jobs. But by default, they're all going to kick off and run at the same time. A step then is either a shell script or a shell command that uses the run property, or it, we're going to call one of those custom actions and have it return data back to us. It's important to note that all of your steps, though, are going to run on the exact same runner. You're not going to have step one run at Ubuntu and then step two run on Windows. They're all going to run in the exact same runner. Oops, go to the next one. An action then, as I alluded to earlier, is simply a, a self-contained module, shareable piece of automation that usually performs a single or, or has a very narrow focus of tasks. But the cool thing about actions, especially as you begin to build your own custom actions, is that we can use them a lot like Lego blocks and chain them together to build out unique, fine, tailored automations for exactly what you need to do. Now. The workflow file has some things that you have to put into it. The first thing is we have to define event. We have to tell the GitHub Actions platform which event that we should have it trigger or kick off our workflow. It also has to have at least one job, and that single job or jobs each have to have at least one or more steps to define what they're going to use or going to do. Excuse me. So are you ready to build your first workflow? Yeah? Of course. All right. So I'm going to kick back over here. If the font is too small, please let me know. So what is one of the things every workflow has to have? Just said it. Has to have event. an event. Okay. So what? how we tell the GitHub Actions platform the event we want to use is we're going to use the property called on. Now, I will give a shout out to JetBrains, who makes a wonderful collection of IDEs and also has plugins to help us build workflows. So that's what you're seeing kick on right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and say on. The event, and here it lists all the different events that we can choose from. Whoops, I just hit the wrong button, so let's try that again. On, uh, come on, on, there we go. I'm gonna choose the workflow dispatch. That event allows us to manually trigger a workflow so I don't have to recreate one of these other events to kick off my workflow. All right, what well, was something else I said we have to have? Jobs. So I'm going to use the jobs property. All right, every job has to have a job ID. So I'm going to call this one say hello. And then, whoops, the button's too fast today. Inside of that job, we have to tell the actions platform what about this job. Runs on. Run. Yeah, I got to tell where it's going to run, right? So I'm going to use the runs on property. 
In this case, I'm going to say I want to use Ubuntu's latest. And then every job has to have one or more what? Some type of thing we want to do. That particular word was called a close. That's this, that's this part. Let's say hello. It has a bunch of steps. steps. Yeah, so I'm going to say, all right, we need some steps. That's right. Each step is an array of things. Yeah, it's all right. So then each step is either going to run or use something. In this case, I'm going to just do a run. So I'm going to say run, echo, hello there. Oops. All right. Now, are you ready to see this workflow in action? Sure. You can say yes. All right. Hold on. Get back over. There we go. All right. So let's go. If you'd like to see these run, if you go out to my GitHub profile, which is github.com slash Gilzo, my last name, it's pinned in the upper right-hand corner. GitHub Actions presentation. I'm going to here. Inside of that repository, there's an Actions tab. All of my various actions are listed here on the left. The one that we just built was first.yaml. So I'm going to click on that one. Because we said this is going to be triggered by a workflow dispatch, that manual trigger, notice on the right, I have a button to tell, that tells the action platform to go ahead and run this workflow. So I'm going to kick it off. Previous runs of the workflow have that green check mark. When I know, I'll know when one has been picked up because I'll have a dot next to it. I can click on that. That'll then list all of my jobs. Right now, it's giving me that job ID I gave it. So I'll click on it, dig it farther into there, and I can see it did, in fact, run and echo out. Hello there. Wow. wow, there we go. Okay, isn't that exciting? Like, you just built your very first workflow. Yay. Yay, right? All right, and that's the first step to learning all this is how – I know it's a hello there. We'll get back into more complex stuff. But that first step is the important part, right? Understanding how you kick it off pieces that are required. So you just built your first one. All right, but let's dig a little deeper. Let's go a little farther into it. Um, I said each job has to have a job ID, and they do. Um, each job ID has to be unique inside the workflow. They can, you can reuse the same job ID in other workflows, but inside the same one, they have to be unique. They have to be alphanumeric, dashes or underscores, and they have to start with either a letter or an underscore. Your steps then, because each of your jobs have to have steps, it's simply an array of tasks. But it's important to know that each step is going to run in its own process inside the runner, but it also has access to the workspace and the file system of the runner. So if an earlier step writes to a file, later steps will also have access to that same file system and be able to access those files. Now again, they have to either use the uses keyword, which we'll use in just a second, or the run. And to, in uses is going to use one of those custom actions where run is going to do like we just did, run some shell command or shell script. So you're ready to build your second workflow. Yes. Because the other piece I forgot to tell you about the warnings is that, uh, one, I expect you to interact with me, but two, they're going to be pop quizzes. All right, so what do we have to have here in our workflow? What's the one that we got to start with? Yeah. An event, okay, so I'm going to use the on keyword again. So I'm going to say on workflow dispatch. All right, now previously when we were, looked at the list of actions, it just gave me the file name. That's going to get real hard as we add more and more and more workflows. So one of the things you have is a name property. We can give it a more human readable name. All right, what was the next piece that every workflow has to have? Has to have it. It has to have a runner, but what's running on the runner? The jobs. So I got a jobs. All right, so just like with the name property for the workflow, your jobs can also have name properties. So instead of seeing that job ID, which has to be alphanumeric dashes and underscores, I can have a more human friendly name listed in the list of those jobs. All right, so then each job has to have something you mentioned earlier the runner. All right, so I'm going to do runs on Ubuntu, just like last time. And then every job has to have one or more. Steps. steps. So I'm going to do the exact same one as last time, but let's use some more. So in this case, in step two, I'm going to use an action. Now, unlike some other CI systems, uh, GitHub Actions does not give you your repository where you're running the workflow. So right now, if I were to try to access any of these other files from this workflow, I wouldn't have access. 
So you have to check out your repository if you need access to some of those files. And that's what this action does. When I call this action, it's going to go and it's going to check out my repository into the file system on that runner. All right. So the next step, in this case, I'll say, all right, well, I want to cat out the contents of that list.txt. Now that I have access to the files in my repo, I can actually touch them. But just like with the job and with the workflow itself, I also have a name property for individual steps. Because previously, the, name, the list of steps was simply what the step was doing. As you get more and more steps, that would be complex or difficult to be able to see exactly which step is which. So we can also give it name properties, and I'll just add a fourth step. So you're ready to see number two in action. Yeah, yeah there you go. The answer is yes. You do want to see this. So I'll go back into my actions. Uh, now we can see, where is it? Is it hiding from me? Oh, there's right. Welcome to the party second. If I click on it and kick it off. As soon as it's picked up here, soon as, there it goes. Now notice my job no longer says say underscore hello. I've got that nice property. If I click on it, then you can see each of the steps. Now that third step it doesn't just say what it's doing. It's got that nice property. And if I click on it, it did in fact have access to the file system in that repo. Wow. Hey, there we go. All right, I like you. <laughs> you just built your second one. All right, we got two down. We got a couple more to build. All right, oh, almost forgot. So, we have been talking, I have been talking. You haven't been talking, I've been talking. So we've been talking for 17 minutes. Is anyone wondering to themselves, okay, Paul, this is supposed to be a presentation on GitHub Actions, and so far you've spent 18 minutes talking about workflows. Anybody wondering that? <laughs> Not, not, I suppose. not yet, you said, I didn't until you just said that, right? <laughs> now that you mention it, okay. Can you use an action directly? Probably. No, no, you can't. You can't use actions directly. <laughs> you can only use an action through a workflow. So even if we were to build an action, we wouldn't be able to use it unless we understood how to build our workflows. So we have to be able to understand workflows before we can use our actions. The other reason I do it this way is that some of the types of custom actions we can build overlap greatly with the kind of workflows we've just building, up to 80%. In fact, some of the things they share are things like inputs. So if you're trying to build a reusable piece of automation, at some point, that piece of automation needs to be able to accept some information, right? So we need to be able to define inputs. The two types of workflows that can utilize inputs are the dispatch, which, which we've been using, and the call. But otherwise, we, get, we, got a, we have a section or the ability to define a collection of inputs that we want to accept information in. Each of those do have to have an ID similar to the job ID. They have to be alphanumeric dashes or underscores. But they do have some additional requirements that we haven't seen. So for actions, they have to have a description. Uh, some optional pieces that you have is you can mark an input as required or not. And if you have one that's not required, you can also give it a default value. Once we've defined those inputs, as we begin to run our runners, or run our, excuse me, run our jobs and begin to work through those steps, we can access the information provided in those inputs by something called an inputs context, which we'll go over next. So you're ready to see inputs in action. Of course. There we go. I like that. All right. So let's go, let me jump over here. We're going to go to our third one. So again, what does every workflow have to have? Event. Event. After that, we have to have jobs. All right, so I've got the same job. I'm going to do say hello again. i got the property. Mm -hmm. Inside, we have to tell it where to run by using the runs on property. Then every job has to have one or more steps. steps. All right, so now what I want to do is I don't want to just say hello there. I want to say hello to somebody, right? I want to be able for this workflow to accept some information from whatever's calling it. So we do that with the inputs property. Inside of a workflow dispatch, the inputs property is a sub property of the workflow dispatch itself. Each of the inputs have to have an ID. In this case, I'm going to call it the name. And then I can give it those properties we I just talked about, a description. I can say what kind it is, and then also whether or not it's required. So let's try this one and see it in action. So I'm going to go back to my actions, 
This time it is hidden down here at the bottom called third. I'm going to run this, and now notice when I run this, what shows up. Let me zoom in a little bit. Yeah, yeah, a little input. And it's the description that I put inside that configuration, right? So just so you know, I'm not lying, and I'm not doing anything. Behind the scenes, I'll say Asheville 2024. Oh, wait, I almost messed up. Hold on, let me cut, by, cut that out. What happens if I try to run this? It's required. It's required, so it should say no. You can't do that. I almost forgot to show you that part. So put that back in there. I'm going to run that workflow. Zoom back out a little bit. Let that get picked up. There it goes. There's our job. There it goes. And did it, in fact. There it is. And this, this is exactly the exact, it's the exact same thing you're going to do for an action. If you have an action, you're going to take and have an inputs area, and you're going to put these same properties, and then any workflow that calls your action is going to provide those inputs, and you're going to have the exact same controls. All right, so let's come back and let's talk about context. Context are how GitHub Actions Platform provides information to your workflows and to your actions. It could be information about the workflow itself, it could be about the runner, it could be about the job that's running or the step. It's all the information that you might need. Now they're exposed to your code as objects with properties, and those properties are either strings or further objects with properties. And you have 12 different types of contexts. So let me pop over here so I can show you this. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. 12 different types of context, but it is important to remember that you're not going to have every context in every scenario. What I mean by that is if you haven't defined any inputs, well then you're not going to have access to the inputs context because there are no inputs. Zoom back out, make sure we can see that later, and come back over. Now, you access a context for any of your code that's not using the JavaScript SDK provided by GitHub. You access those using a dollar sign, two curly braces, the context name dot the property name and then two curly braces. So earlier I did, or was it, inputs dot the name. So I said go back up to my inputs and then grab the value that was inserted or given for the ID of the name. Or in a case of like steps, if I want to grab some value from a, fir from a previous step, I would use the steps context, its ID, its output objects, and then the ID of the output that it was given back. If you're using the JavaScript SDK, they provide uh, methods for each of the different contexts. So git input, git vars, git etc. Now, there is, this is a very important, if you don't remember any of the other caveats and warnings, please remember this one, is that many of the contexts where the information is coming from some user, that value, that information is not automatically escaped, prepared for you to use directly. Pull request is a great example. If you have a public repository where you're accepting uh, external pull requests, that pull request title comes from the user input. So if I were going to try to set a shell variable called title and then say equal double quote and then that's that value, that pull request title, and they gave me a pull request title of a double quote semicolon, I'd end up with title equals double quote a double quote semicolon, and what does the semicolon represent in a terminal? The end of one command, the beginning of another, and so now it would run whatever's after. So just be aware that a lot of those contexts, particularly the ones that come from user supplied information, are not prepared, and depending on how you're going to use them, will determine how you prepare them for your use. All right, so if your action, if your workflow, if your steps have ingested some type of information to do that automation, then at some point you're probably going to want to send information back out. You're going to want to play back that information to somebody. Uh, so outputs are how your actions or your steps can send information back out. Uh, so it could be either that you want to send it back to somebody that's used your, uh, your action, or it could be inside your own workflow where you have one step that's going to send some information and you need to access that information at a later step. So we set those outputs. If you're inside anything but inside the JavaScript SDK, 
Then you're going to do echo the output ID name that you want equals the value, and then you redirect that to the environment variable called GitHub output. If you're using the JavaScript SDK, then they all, again provide you a method for doing so. And then we access those later, or that output in later steps using that steps context. So let me show you an example. We won't walk through this one, or we won't build this one together, but I'll show you this one. So the top half of this is exactly what we've done earlier, right? We have, I'm not doing anything extra here. I've got, I've got an input, I'm saying hello, etc. But down in now in the new step, in the second step, I'm gonna capture the value from the date command. And I'm gonna store that as an output. So I'm gonna say current time equals what I just grabbed. I'm gonna send that to the output. And then in the last step, then I'm going to go, hey, go back up to the steps, go to the step with the ID of get time, go to its output object, and grab the value that was stored as current time. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So let's see that. And again, I won't play this one, but we'll just go look at it from a previous run. Uh, I don't know what time it is. So I'll dig in here, and you can see here, here's the third step where I grab the current time and store it, and then the last step, I'm able to access that information. Now, you might be saying, well, couldn't I just run date in the last step? Yeah, yeah right? Okay, but this, is, but this could also be where you've got an action that you've called in step two that's doing some processing, and now you want to access the information it's sending back out. Yeah, programmatically. Programmatically, and you need to use that information in the next step. This is how you access that. All right, everybody still good? All right. Uh, we did the outputs example. Okay, so now we've got all the information we need and we are prepared to begin building our own custom actions. But are they capital actions, capital A actions? No. No, they're lowercase actions. That's right, remember that. All right, so we have three types of custom actions that we can build. We can build Docker, JavaScript, or Composite. Uh, Docker is nice because you can build up your own Docker file, embed your Docker, Yay. all of your action code, and then when you call the action, uh, the actions platform will retrieve that profile or that container, build that container up, and then run your action code. It is a little slower because it is going to have to retrieve that. It's going to have to build it up, so it's a little bit slower. Uh, JavaScript is nice because you can kind of bundle up all of your actual action code separate from your environment. Uh, the downside there, though, is if you want to utilize somebody else's custom action code inside of your custom action, and they haven't provided that as a JavaScript package that you can access, you can't use it inside of yours, which is what the third type is. A composite allows you to use everybody else's custom actions through the actions platform, like Lego blocks, to build up exactly the automation that you need. Now, every custom action, regardless of the type, has to be either stored in its own repository or it has to be stored in its own directory in an existing repository. Now, actions do have several things that they require. First is they have to have an action metadata file. That file has to be named action, it has to be a YAML file, and it has to be sitting in the root of where the action is being stored. So either in the root of the repository or the root of the directory. The metadata file itself requires at least three properties, a name, a description, and a runs with a sub-property of runs using. And it's the runs using where we designate the type of custom action we're building, Docker, uh, JavaScript, or Composite. Then, in addition, the metadata file can define those inputs and outputs like we just used. Now, depending on the type of custom action you're building, there will be additional properties that are required, such as, let me take a look here. So this would be a JavaScript-based custom action. I've got a name, greet to user, description, greet to user, to the platform, and then I've got runs using, and I've said it's node 20. That's what designates it as a JavaScript custom action. And because it's JavaScript, then I'm also required to provide a main property, which is the entry point file for that JavaScript code. Quick warning, uh, when you build out a custom action, the keywords Docker and Composite are what you'll use for those two. For JavaScript, as you just saw, you use Node, which version of Node you want to use. As of right now, the Actions platform only supports Node 20. They did support 16 up until September or October of last year. 
My guess is they'll begin to support Node 22 when it goes LTS in October. But for now, if you're building a JavaScript-based custom action, you have to target Node 20. The other challenge with a JavaScript-based custom action, that is a lot to say, by the way, JavaScript-based custom action, is that you have to bundle, you have to commit all of your JavaScript dependencies to the repository. So you can't, it's not gonna run an NPM install or an NPX install uh, and then pull in all those dependencies. You have to commit all those dependencies into the repository or use something like Vercel's NCC to bundle all of that into a single file. If you're using a composite or building a composite-based custom action, it is possible that the runner that's being used may not have the version of the binaries you're expecting. So you may need to update those in order to make sure that it's the version that you need. If you find yourself having to do a lot of updates to binaries, that's when you might go back to like a Docker where you can set up the environment exactly how you need. Are you ready to build a custom action? Yeah. Yeah, you have all the tools you need to build this custom action. All right, so what did I say every action has to have? Okay. An event, no, close. That was workflows. Oh, a name. A name, all right, so I'm gonna give it, oops, I'm gonna give this a name. We'll call this welcome to the party with an action. Then it has to have a description. So this one's gonna welcome somebody to our party. What was the third thing? We've got the description. We have to tell it, we have to tell the GitHub Actions platform this is going to be a specific type of custom action, right? Yeah. So that was with the runs property and runs using. using. So in this case, we're gonna build a composite custom action. When we build a composite custom action, guess what it needs? Mirrors exactly what we did with the workflows. Anybody have a guess? Close. What do jobs have? Steps. steps. Yeah, we have to have steps. So the composite action, its additional required property is it has to have steps, just like the workflow we built. So in this case, I'm going to have a step with a name, give it a nice name property, add an ID. I can even designate the shell type if you'd like to do that. And now what I want to do is I want to do run. So I can either do runs or using. I'm going to do run again. And for this one, what I want to do is I want to have the action accept some inputs. And the action is going to out output hello there. So previously, how did we define inputs? In the workflow. What's that? Yeah, we had the inputs property with the ID. So we're going to have an inputs property. Now that we're in an action, it's top level property instead of a sub property, but otherwise it's the exact same. We're going to have an ID, who degree, so that's what I had down there, a description, type, and required. Now, that's it. This is a complete action. It's ready to go, except can we run actions directly? No. What do we have to do instead? We have to have a workflow. So let's build the workflow with it. What does a workflow need? Vent. Before even event, we gotta have the name, or not the name, but the, oh, so that was the event, my bad. Oops, got myself mixed up. Have to have the event, and then we have to have, you said earlier, job. jobs, job ID, and then we have to tell the action platform where it's gonna run with the, run, that's how somebody say it, runs on. Then we have to have yeah. steps. Okay. Now, the action I created earlier is right here, so it's in this repository. Can my workflow access the files in this repository by default? No, I had to do what? I have to check it out, so I'm gonna add a step to check out. Then after that, now I have access to it. Now I can say run this action. But our action is asking for inputs, right? All right, so back in my workflow, I need to provide those inputs. To do that, we're gonna use the with keyword. So say, we're going to say run this action with this information. So to provide that information, you give it the ID and then some value. In this case, what I want to do is I want, the, I want us to give the workflow the input. I want the workflow to turn around and take our input and give it to the action. And so the action can work on that input. So I'm going to add some inputs up here, just like we did earlier with the name. And so now what's going to happen is we're going to go put in a name. Our workflow is going to give it to the action. The action is then going to take that input and output it. Good? All right, let's go see it in action. So they flip back over to here. So now we got our workflow with an action. Where is it? Oh, right there. 
Yeah, let's run that workflow. What name you want me to put in here? Anybody? Name. My name? Okay. Is my name? Oh, I'm in there already, but we'll do it again. <laughs> let's run that. So now that's gonna our app, our workflow is gonna hand it to the action. Any second now. There we go. There's our job. It's, there's the checkout. There called the action. And there you go. Well. All right. So I'm gonna double check. Does everybody know what the actions platform is now? Yeah. Yeah. Do you understand? Or remember at least the majority of the pieces and parts that make up a workflow. But with the number of times I asked you, yeah. I'm going to bet yes. <laughs> a lot better now. A lot better now. All right. So you know the components of a workflow. We built those workflows together, right? We talked about the action, the different types of actions we can build and the pieces and parts that are required for actions. And we built our first custom action and then talked about uh, the different warnings and things that you might need to be aware of as you're working on these. Does everybody feel pretty accomplished in this set of goals? All right, so I've got about eight minutes. What I want to do now is show you a custom action using everything I've covered but being used in a continual real life example okay so putting it all together one of the things that my team does it on a platform is when you go into our console uh, you can go in and you can say I want like a new Drupal 10 site my team manages the repository that powers that new site so one of the things that I have to do is make sure that that repository is always up to date with the latest changes but also working all the time so one of the things I needed to do is I wanted to make sure that not just for Drupal, but for anything that we support, we run visual regression testing um, against the production copy of it versus this new copy of it before we make the changes to make sure that nothing has introduced a regression into that code. I don't want you as a customer to have ever ex uh, experience that regression. Yeah. Now, is everybody familiar with visual regression testing? No? Okay, let me, let me show you an example. Um, for what I did, I used black, uh, Backstop. Backstop is a JavaScript-based visual regression tester. Uh, visual regression testing works by going out to a baseline or production URL, and it takes screenshots. It then takes a testing or development URL, takes screenshots, and then diffs the two. So I've got an example here of a report. Uh, so in this case, I had one failure, and let me bring this up. So here's my reference screenshot. Here's the testing site screenshot, and if I do a diff on it, I can see that something changed. Something added, maybe some padding or some margin or something. I mean, if you just look at the two visually, you might not even notice that they're different. They're just slightly different, right? Which is why visual regression testing is so important, because you want to make sure that you haven't introduced a regression that you can't physically see. So what I needed to do is I needed to build a GitHub action that allowed me to run visual regression tests against any of our projects. So let me show this to you. So again, this is you've seen all of this. Everything I'm going to show you here, you have seen so far. Okay, so this is the actual action. So I've got my action meta file here at the base. I've got a name and a description and inputs. And what are the two things I told you a visual regression tested needs to run? Yeah, I gotta have the two URLs, right? A production or reference URL, baseline URL, and a testing one. So I said they're strings, they're required, and then I'm using composite. I'm gonna build a composite one. Now, one of the really cool things I think about platform is that we have integrations with GitHub, and so when you create a pull request, it contacts us and sends us your pull request code. We then take that code, clone all of your production data into a new isolated environment with your PR code and then bring that up as an ephemeral environment and then send that information back to GitHub so that when you run tests on that environment, you're running it with the exact same data that you'll have in production, but with the exact same code that you have in PR if you were to merge it and move it to production. So I've got an action here, another custom action, and all this thing does is test that the URL that it's given is a URL. Does a regex against it, says does this look like a URL, and then does a quick curl to make sure that the server is responding with a 200. So I do that once with the baseline URL, once with the test URL. 
Then, because this is a JavaScript-based package, I do an npm install to install backstop. Now, backstop stores its configuration in a JSON file. And what I need to do is I need to swap out the original URLs with the ones I was just given in the input. And the easiest way to do that is with a little program called JQ, uh, JSON Query. It usually comes with most versions of Linux. But in the public runners, it's at 1.6. And I really wanted to use 1.7 because 1.7 had some syntactic sugar that was a little nicer to work with and make this a little cleaner. So I used somebody else's action, again like Lego blocks, to upgrade the JQ version to 1.7. The next step then is I just run a cat, passing it into JQ, swapping out the URLs, and then saving that configuration file back to the file system. Because every step's working on the same file system, I don't have to worry about the next step not having access to that, because it's going to have access to the same file system. So the next step is I run the baseline test. Oh, sorry, I skipped that, didn't I? There it is, there's the run reference. So I'm saying run the reference, so go out to the production site, take my screenshots. Then, in the next step, I say, all right, now that you've got those production screenshots, run the test against the development environment. Now, previously, I told you that every step is sequential and that uh, previous steps, are, if they fail, they'll fail out of the rest of the steps, the rest of the steps will be skipped. We can alter that behavior by saying, all right, continue on error. Even if I get an error here, that's okay. Keep going with the rest of the steps. So in this case, I capture the exit code from, uh, I just lost the word, backstop. When backstop has a failure in the test, it, exit with, it exits with a non-zero, which would normally fail out the step. And I don't want that to happen. I don't need a, a red X on the step because a failed test isn't necessarily a failure of the step, I, but I do need to know about it. So in this case, I save it to a different context called environment. Okay, so just like what we did with the outputs, it's a different context. Notice then in the next step, I have the option, where do you go there? I have the option on whether to not to run this step based on some other information. Because do I want to save a visual regression testing report if the tests all pass? No. Yeah, not really. Yeah, right, right? If it, it all passes, I don't care what it looks like. It's going to be the same. I only care if it fails. So I'm saying only if that previous step failed do I want to run this step. This step then uses another action called upload artifacts, and then it saves that report as an artifact and then attaches it to this workflow run. Then the last is I do want to say always run this and then report back what that what backstop reported. So if it failed, now report this as a failed step or a success. But can I run this action directly? No. No. All right, so you all remember it now. So I have a workflow that sits inside of every uh, one of our projects. And so on a pull request where the target branch is main, that's our production branch, I want you to, ha I want you to run a series of steps. So this first step is calling another action, and what this does, remember I told you that once we get that pull request, we build a new environment and we send that information back. This action is asking GitHub, hey, have you gotten that information back yet? And it sits and pulls the GitHub Actions platform until it receives that URL back from platform, and then it saves it as an output. So then the second step is to run that action I just showed you, sending in the output from this step as the test URL. And since my production URL rarely ever changes, I've stored it as a repository secret inside GitHub. Make sense? Yeah, a little bit? You want to see it? Yeah. Okay. So back over here, here is my production website. All right, here is the pull request that occurred. Notice that the platform check completed, and if I open up this link, whoop, let's go there, notice now it's an exact copy of my production site. The only way right now I know that it's different is notice the URL matches the pull request. So the URL is pull request for this site, but we can see that the visual regression testing failed, and now if I go over to the details for that run, 
Sure enough, I can see, here we go, backstop visual regression testing failed. Please see the pro, uh, generated report. If I go to the summary for this run, all the way down here at the bottom is an attached download. That is the report all zipped up and saved for me. And if I bring that up, I can see, sure enough, I had zero pass and four failures. And if I take a look at that diff, here's my production site. Here's that test site. Oh, wow, lots of stuff changed. I can even kind of scroll back and forth. It looks like the menu size has changed. It looks like there might be some spacing or some margins or padding in the rest of the things too. All right, good. All right, I think I've got zero time for questions. Oh, sorry about that. Ah, but there are, you, you'll have access to this presentation with all these resources. Uh, the, the documentation actually is pretty good despite some of those little caveats I gave you earlier. So definitely check those out. Um, if you have any questions, I am super easy to find. If you can just write down my last name and then Google search for Gilzo, there's like 20 of us in the US. They're all related to me. They'll get a hold of me. So, and I'm Gilzo pretty much everywhere. Or you can scan my QR code. Cool. So that's, I think that's it for me. Any questions? Did you learn something? At least something, a little bit? All right. So I accomplished my goal. I feel good. All right. So I think the last thing we have today is...